Before internet shopping, there was Argos. When it began in 1973 Argos even looked a bit like the internet looks now and the experience of shopping with Argos was like an analog click and buy. The contents page, a pictorial grid, resembled a portal like BuzzFeed. The products were neatly categorized. Jewelry pages offering multiple types of plain gold chain with minutely distinct links, Venetian, Serpentine, Foxdale, Cobra, Trace and Curb Belcher. Item descriptions were often fetishistically detailed, habitually rounded off with the words, complete with. Some of the product names from this period full of forward slashes read like a URL. Gents Scientific Calculator, Chrome, Alarm, LCD Watch. The language resembles that of online shopping with its keywords and search terms. Argos was launched in summer 1973 by Richard Tompkins, a man who had an eye for consumer novelty. He died in 1992 but his widow, Elizabeth Tompkins, who still shops at Argos, says she recalls being invited to go to America to see the new phenomenon of catalog shopping. We went to Canada and the US and were very impressed. It took a further year to bring Argos to launch it. As a result of that research trip, its shops were not shops, but showrooms. Newspaper advertisements promised a shopping revolution. Argos launched with a show, complete with dances and specially written songs. It was an event. Argos offered the convenience of shopping at home, with the face-to-face -face contact of a local shop. An editorial in the inaugural Staff magazine listed definitions of Argos. It was Greek for Swift and the oldest continuously inhabited town in Europe. A great river, an ancient civilization, the geography may differ but the declaration of ambition, the motivation by scale, do not. From the start, Argos was a value retailer. Its logo has always been red and white, as if shouting, sale. The little pens, the forms to fill in, the wait for a number to be called, all echo the paraphernalia of a betting shop, a bingo hall or a long wait in a government building. What Argos did was to identify a niche for people who wanted to be individual customers, who found the prospect of a grilling by a department store sales assistant mortifying. But who wanted something more private than the communal consumption of the catalogue? Argos offered a pathway out of the catalogue experience, gave catalogue consumers a starting point they would recognise and led them into its shops, showed them how to migrate to something better. Argos was aspirational and its strange new shopping system dramatised the redemption of that aspiration. Then, as now, the first act was the catalogue. Suspense grew as the assistant typed in the code, would it be in stock? Then the payment, fulfillment of a sort, and a second slip to take to the collection point. And finally, the wait for your box to arrive from above wobbling down a conveyor belt. As a child, I sat at home and looked longingly through the Argos catalogue, imagining what I would buy if only I had money of my own. For nearly 50 years, Argos has been an institution on our high streets and in our homes. Argos put an aspirational lifestyle within the nation's grasp. This is thanks in part to the catalogues, or as they once called them, the Book of Dreams. At the crest of the 90s, 80% of British homes had a catalogue, and it was Europe's most widely printed publication. 10 million weighty copies were printed at one annual height, in more UK homes than any other book except the Bible. But last year its circulation had shrunk to 3 million. Though our buying behaviors have moved past the need for the physical book, public grief has metabolized the collective nostalgia. Harking back to the identities we constructed and lives we aspired to with the catalog as children. The Argos catalog is social history. In the same way we may look to the Magna Carta to understand medieval community rule, or the Theologia Platonica for the beginnings of moral philosophy. Perceptive scholars of a distant future may traverse the Argos catalogue to demystify the last half-century. 
Shopping catalogues can be important research items, charting social histories, economic fluctuations, and physical evidence for critical junctures in domestic life. They provide a window on two changing tastes, behaviors, and cultural practices. With globalization and brand domination, product placement and cultural zeitgeist capturing items grew through the 80s and 90s, it is noticeable how much product is focused on what we have seen. Rather than the inherent utility of the product itself, like where children's bedding begins to feature Star Wars scenes and Teletubbies. Amid this, the Argos catalog bridged a strange gulf between capitalist dogma, social identity, and children's growing imagination for play. Maintaining an equipoise for which they could imagine worlds they wished to build for themselves. The book was a piece of children's literature itself, a symbiotic, creative, and importantly, child-quieting activity. Social class is implicit to surveying the book with its budget-friendly jewelry and homeware selection. For poorer children, the act of marking out a multi-story climbing frame or Kylo Ren Deluxe electronic lightsaber was a thrilling ritual, and if nothing else, cathartic. A child in a capital city could dream of camping holidays decked out with all the gear, while another was mapping journeys in coveted yellow roller skates for concrete city bowls. In July 2020 the announcement was made that they had decided to stop printing the Argos catalog. The encyclopedia-like catalogs will no longer be regularly printed by the end of January 2021. Many declared childhood had been ruined by the news and mourned that children will never know the joys of circling potential birthday and Christmas gifts. You could say the Argos catalogue was a training ground for the shopping habits of adult millennials today. Inclined to covet homes they can't ever afford on heavily filtered Zoopla searches and infinite scroll Instagram feeds.